Karate friends, welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and happy autumn everyone, happy Halloween in honor of this spooky day. Today we are going to be talking about necromancy in ancient Rome and Greece. The source for today's video comes from an excellent book called Mantique, and specifically a chapter within that book entitled Necromancy Goes Underground by Christopher Ferroni, I presume is how you pronounce that last name. So in the ancient world, people would regularly engage with what we might call magic or ritual belief in and interaction with the supernatural. Now, all of those terms that I just used are pretty anachronistic to use for the ancient world. They just had a totally different mindset. And so those words just don't really work, but we also don't have any better ones. So those are the ones I'm going to use, but just keep it in mind that uh, it's not always quite conveying what I want it to. Um, and people in the ancient world, like I said, engaged in these things all the time, on the regular, but they didn't engage in them willy-nilly. Most people definitely recognized that there were charlatans, right? People who would sell you fake potions, fake spells, who were lying about their interactions with the supernatural. And most people in the ancient world also recognized that there were certain forms of ritual or magic that were taboo, <laughs> that you did not mess with if you were a normal upstanding person and necromancy or most magic that involved the underworld and the dead for that matter was generally put in that category. I am generalizing some here, obviously not all magic that had to do with the underworld was completely taboo at all times and all places, but to speak generally, there was kind of a taboo or an uncomfortableness around the underworld and the inhabitants of the underworld. So for example, there are these goddesses named the Furies and they're female goddesses of vengeance and they live in the underworld. And usually they're not called the Furies. They have a euphemistic nickname that you refer to them by if you have to refer to them, which is the Eumenides or the friendly ones. So a lot of things in the underworld you will approach in this way. If you have to mention them, at all, you're going to mention them indirectly uh, to avoid summoning them, so to speak. You know, you don't want to speak of the devil. And similarly, Hades or Pluto often is not referred to by his actual name. He's referred to by one of his many nicknames or euphemisms. And the gods of the underworld are rarely, if ever, worshipped by living mortals. Uh, it seems like maybe the idea behind this is that they can't really help you out <laughs> too much. The gods like Venus and Jupiter Jupiter and Hephaestus, they can all help you in your life, uh, but Hades can't really do much for you. He can't keep you from dying. You're headed down there one way or the other. So these gods just generally aren't talked about, and if they are talked about, again, it's in that euphemistic sort of way. But just because something is taboo, it doesn't mean that people altogether stop engaging with it. There are plenty of people who still were engaging in underworld magic. They just tended to go a little bit underground with it, as that chapter I mentioned is all about. And so the magical texts and spells and things that we find tend to be a little vague. <laughs> they tend to avoid directly incriminating themselves. So enough preamble, let's take a look at an actual example. The the next text is the first spell of Pittis, and it was probably by an Egyptian priest. Oh, blessed and imperishable one, uh, the sun, indeed, even now I beg you, master of the cosmos, if you go into the hollow of the earth in the land of the dead, send this ghost to me in the middle hours of the night, in order that he, compelled at your commands, from whose cup this thing comes, and let him tell me however many things I want in my mind, speaking the entire truth, gentle, mild, and pondering no thoughts against me. And may you not be wrathful at my sacred charms, for you yourself arranged among mortals that they learn about the threads of the Morai on your advice. So this spell is really cool, and it typifies a lot of things that are very common that come up all the time in this sort of magic. First, we are summoning a god. <laughs> We're asking for his help to bring this spell about. In this case, it happens to be the sun god. 
Next, we are asking him to bring us a ghost. And this is, of course, what necromancy is all about. We want this ghost to come be our servant slash slave for a little while to help assist us in whatever we're trying to accomplish with this spell. This is the most common element of all. And usually the ghost is supposed to help you with just a handful of different things. So maybe the most common is help with information. So the ghost will tell you something or will find something out for you. Two, you want to curse someone. So you'll send the ghost to go haunt somebody. And three, which is very similar to two, but much more bizarre, is that you'll summon a ghost and then you'll send them to haunt somebody because you're in love with them and you want them to love you back. So this is a sort of love magic and somehow the ghost can make someone else fall in love slash lust with you. It doesn't make any sense in my brain, but this is a very common form of magic in the ancient world. So apparently to them, it made sense. Of course, safety is always important when engaging in activities like this, especially since most of the ghosts who are summoned in this way are the spirits of people who died particularly violently or who died with important things in their life left to accomplish. You just want people who are a little more restless, right? Who aren't the restful, peaceful, you know, at peace with being dead, dead. You want the dead who are still flying around. I guess they are easier to grab a hold of and in involve in mortal life. Um, but these are very volatile spirits. So once you're done with your spell, it's important to put them back to rest. So usually people would do something like seal the mouth shut or just crush the skull entirely so that there is no way that this ghost can come back again or engage with anyone else. Still, a lot of this is just in code, indirect, it's not the direct accounts and descriptions that we would really love. The closest thing we get maybe is the passage in literature, actually from Lucan's Pharsalia. So this is an epic work about one of the Roman civil wars. And in this work, at one point, Sextus Pompey, who's the son of Pompey the Great, he wants some information about how a battle is going to go. So he goes and consults a witch and she performs a necromancy to give him this information. And it is super melodramatic, over the top, full of gratuitous gore it's really disgusting and it just goes on and on and it's probably a huge exaggeration of anything that ever actually took place but it is so much fun so to finish up this video i'm not going to read the whole thing because it's pages and pages you should absolutely check it out but i'm just kind of going to summarize a little bit and then read a little bit and go back and forth like that so let's get started so we're going to start off with just a description of the witch and her evil ways she buries in the grave the living whose souls still direct their bodies. While years are still due to them from destiny, death comes upon them unwillingly. Or she breaks back the funeral from the tomb with procession reversed, and the dead escape from death. When the dead are confined in stone, which drains off the internal moisture, absorbs the corruption of the marrow, and makes the corpse rigid, then the witch eagerly vents her rage on all the limbs, thrusting her fingers into the eyes, scooping out gleefully the stiffened eyeballs and gnawing the yellow nails on the withered hand. Nor is she slow to take life if such warm blood is needed, as gushes forth at once when the throat is slit, and if her ghoulish feast demands still palpitating flesh. In the same way, she pierces the pregnant womb and delivers the child by an unnatural birth, in order to place it on the fiery altar, and whenever she requires the service of a bold, bad spirit, she takes life with her own hand. Then next we get her choosing out the body that she's going to use for this necromancy. Meanwhile, the witch picks out her prophet, prying into the inmost parts cold in death, till she finds the substance of the stiffened lungs unwounded and still firm, and seeking the power of utterance in a corpse. The destiny of many victims of battle is hanging now in the balance. Which of them will she decide to restore to the upper world? Had she tried to raise up the whole army on the plain and make them fight again, the laws of Erebus would have yielded to her, and a multitude brought up from Stygian Avernus by the power of the fiend would have taken the field. At last she chose the corpse and drew it along with a neck noosed, and in the dead man's noose she inserted a hook. 
the hapless body was dragged over rocks and stones to live a second time, and was laid beneath the high rock of the hollow mountain which cruel Erichtho had condemned to witness her rites. Next, we're going to take a look at all the things that Erichtho does to prep for this ritual. Then she began by piercing the breast of the corpse with fresh wounds, which she filled with hot blood. She washed the inward parts clean of clotted gore. She poured in lavishly the poison that the moon supplies. With this was blended all that nature inauspiciously conceives and brings forth. The froth of dogs that dread water was not wanting, nor the inwards of a lynx, nor the hump of a foul hyena, nor the marrow of a stag that had fed on snakes. Then she went on to speak plainly in a Thessalian spell, with accents that went down to Tartarus. I invoke the Furies, the horror of hell, the punishments of the guilty, and chaos, eager to blend countless worlds in ruins. I call to the ruler of the world below, who suffers age-long pain because gods are slow to die. To Styx and Lysium, where no Thessalian witch may enter. To Persephone, who shuns her mother in heaven. And to her, the third incarnation of our patron, Hecate, who permits the dead and me to converse together without speech. So after she utters this spell, the ghost sort of starts to return to the corpse, but is very reluctant, so she has to sort of force it the rest of the way in. When she had spoken thus, she raised her head and foaming mouth and saw beside her the ghost of the unburied corpse. It feared the lifeless frame and the hateful confinement of its former prison. It shrank from entering the gaping bosom, the vital parts, and the flesh divided by a mortal wound. Hapless wretch, unjustly robbed of death's last gift, the inability to die a second time. Erichtho marveled that fate had power to linger thus. Enraged with death, she lashed the passive corpse with a live serpent. Um, and finally, we see the spirit actually enter the corpse and Erichtho give it her commands. Instantly, the clotted blood grew warm. It warmed the livid wounds, cursing into the veins and the extremities of the limbs. Struck by it, the vital organs thrilled within the cold breast, and a new life, stealing into the inward parts that had lost it, wrestled with death. Next, the dead man quivered in every limb, the sinews restrained, and he rose, not slowly or limb by limb, but rebounding from the earth and standing erect at once. His mouth gaped wide and his eyes were open. He looked as if he were not yet alive, but already like a man dying. The pallor and stiffness remained, and he was dazed by his restoration to this world. The mouth was fettered and gave forth no sound. Voice and utterance were given him, but only for the purpose of reply. "'Speak at my command,' said the witch, "'and great shall be your reward. For if you speak truth, I shall make you safe from witchcraft throughout all time. On such a pyre and with such fuel shall I burn your body, chanting a Stygian spell the while, that your ghost shall remain deaf to the incantation of all sorcerers. Consider a second life a price worth paying for this. Neither herbs nor spells will dare to break your long sleep of oblivion once you receive death from me. A riddling answer befits the oracles and prophets of the gods, but if any man seeks to know the truth from the dead and has courage to approach the oracles of stern death, let him depart assured. So we see in this passage basically all of the things that we talked about. She obtains a corpse, <laughs> she prepares a ritual, she recites a spell, she makes sure to put restrictions on the ghost so it can only do what she says, and she promises that she's going to bury it for sure <laughs> once she's done and give it a full final rest. So it's just cool to see all of those elements put together, even if it is a little bit uh, melodramatic. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope all of you have a wonderfully spooky day. Special thank you as always to subscribers and to Patreon members, and I hope to see all of you again next week. Carry